Let's now turn our attention to the economic crisis in Pakistan. This is Pakistan. It's a country of approximately 235 million people. 34% of this population is still living below the poverty line. In other words, they earn less than $3.2 a day. Now, how much is that? Around 731 Pakistani rupees or 261 Indian rupees. A lot of these people are now being forced to go to bed hungry. The reason is exorbitant and across the board price rise, inflation, inflation that's running out of control. I'll give you a broad idea. A kilogram of wheat in Pakistan now costs around 447 Pakistani rupees. Onion prices have gone up 501% since January last year, 501%. Chicken, 82.5% costlier. Salt, 49.5% more expensive. Tea, 65.41% more expensive. You see, all of these are basic necessities, basic necessities. But they've become a luxury for many in Pakistan. And that's because inflation is spiraling out of control. And the debt situation in Pakistan is such that it's not easy to give relief to people. As a result of all of that, people in Pakistan are now fighting for survival. Their long queues outside ration shops, their deadly stampedes. So far, at least one person has already been killed trying to secure a bag of food. And unfortunately for those in Pakistan, there's no immediate good news in store. Pakistan is running out of money. When the week began, the country had just $5.8 billion left as forex reserves. That's just enough to pay for a month of imports. Soon, Pakistan may not have the money to pay for food, for fuel, or even for essential medicines. Now, if you're thinking Sri Lanka, you're on the right track, because that's exactly the line Pakistan is heading down if it does not get a bailout and get a bailout fast. Pakistanis have been asked to brace for blackouts. They've been told to close shops by 8.30 p.m. in the evening and to wrap up marriage ceremonies early so that electricity can be rationed. It is a precarious situation. Earlier this week, Pakistan's army chief flew down to West Asia. General Saeed Asim Munir visited Saudi Arabia. He met the Saudi crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. This was his first visit abroad since assuming office. Did General Munir request for funds? Well, probably. The army chief is currently in the UAE and so is Pakistan's Prime Minister, Shahbaz Sharif. Accompanying him is a high-level delegation. So what's happening in the UAE? Sharif is expected to meet UAE's President Mohammed bin Zayed al Nayhan. The word is the two will obviously discuss Pakistan's economic situation. No surprises there. Earlier this week, Pakistan held a fundraising event in the West, Geneva to be specific. Islamabad asked for funds to rebuild after last year's floods. Now, what's Pakistan saying here? Pakistan is saying that this crisis is not entirely our own fault. There, was, there were floods last year, and that's really the reason why we are in a crisis, and you, the West, should help us out. Now, it appears that the West is obliged to some extent. Pakistan managed to secure $9 billion, but it is not going to be enough to rebuild. What Pakistan really needs are $16 billion, and that's just for the floods. But flood damage is only a part of Pakistan's problem. It does not solve or even begin to address the inflation, the food shortage, let alone the burden of debt that Pakistan seems to be sinking deeper into. And that's really the question that Pakistan now has to think about. The debt crisis. How is it going to repay the debt? Will it be rolled over? Will China or Saudi Arabia or the West come to Pakistan's aid? And look, this is a humanitarian problem. As we speak, the people of Balochistan, for example, are desperately crying out for help. The governor has declared that the province has run out of wheat. 600,000 bags of food grain needed to be sent there, but Punjab hasn't shipped it yet. And the other questions Pakistan has to answer, how did it get here? How did Pakistan reach the situation? Sure, the floods did take a toll on the crops, but Pakistan could have imported wheat if it had enough money. Sure, the flood has hit Pakistan's economy, but was it all sun and rainbows before that? Or were the floods just the final nail in the coffin? And let me tell you another thing which the rest of the world now really needs to worry about. When Pakistan is talking to people and asking for a bailout, is Pakistan once again going to be saying or hinting at some of the things that it has often done in the past? Pakistan saying, 
you have to help us. You have to bail us out because if you don't, then the alternative is scary. And Pakistan will be talking about terrorism. And Pakistan is going to be talking about extremist elements gathering ground. Perhaps even that scary possibility of nukes and dangerous material and uranium ending up in black markets, ending up with Iran, ending up with horrible non-state actors. That's, that's frankly a script that the rest of the world has heard before. And it is more than possible that that scary scenario is being spoken about once again. How did Pakistan get here? How did the country end up so broke? Pakistan is not new to economic crisis and there are numerous reasons why. The first being politics. Politics and economy are more interconnected than we think. An unstable country can hardly attract investors, let alone give the much needed assurance to businesses at home. Think Yemen, think Venezuela. Pakistan has never really had a stable government. There have been coups. Internal fighting. When was the last time a prime minister of Pakistan served a full term? The country has had seven prime ministers in the last 10 years. The result is this. Pakistan's average growth since the 1990s has been around 4.5%. India's, on the other hand, has been 6.2%. In 1947, India and Pakistan became two separate countries. Pakistan walked straight to the door of the IMF or the International Monetary Fund. It needed to borrow money to run the country, to survive. Islamabad entered its first IMF program in 1958. Ever since, it's gone to the IMF's door an additional 21 times. Pakistan has not only borrowed from the IMF, but also from China, Japan, France, Germany, the United States, Saudi Arabia, South Korea, Italy, Kuwait. It's a long list, including multilateral agencies, commercial banks, the Asian Development Bank, it won't be wrong to say that Pakistan's economy has been built on the pillar of debt. What Pakistan needs is to fix the very structure of its economy. Islamabad did not help its case by sliding right into China's debt trap and embracing the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Also, its currency has been fast losing value. During the initial months of the pandemic, one USD was equal to nearly 160 Pakistani rupees. Now it is 255 Pakistani rupees to a dollar. Then there is a budget deficit. When the pandemic hit, the government was forced to roll out subsidies. This hit the coffers. Here's another reason for the economic collapse. Pakistan heavily depends on imports for food and fuel. But importing means paying in dollars. Pakistan is running out of forex. Just like Sri Lanka, Pakistan has become a victim of spending more than it earns. What Islamabad needs is to sustain itself, but this road to sustainability cannot involve terror. A recent incident at Heathrow, London hints that Pakistan could be walking down that road again. It could be selling dangerous technology for money. Uranium was found in a shipment of scrap metal sent from Pakistan to London. The country has a history of running a nuclear black market. Remember AQ Khan? the father of Pakistan's atomic weapons program. Sure, Khan built that nuke for Pakistan, but he also sold nuclear technology and nuclear materials to countries like Libya, Iran and North Korea, and also non-state actors. The recent incident in London has left us with big questions. Has desperate Pakistan reopened its nuclear black market? Is Pakistan selling dangerous technology to terror groups for money? We hope not. And to talk about this and a lot more, we're now being joined by Amar Habib Khan. He's the Group Chief Risk Officer at Karandas Pakistan, and he joins us live from Islamabad. Um, welcome to Vian Ahmed. Just wanted to ask you, if you had to take a look at this entire economic situation in Pakistan, how bad is it and how deep is the risk that things could get even worse from here? Uh, the situation is pretty bad, but that can be said for other emerging markets as well, because as interest rates started increasing globally, 
There was a lot of refinance risk, but we see a lot of similar issues in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Lebanon. So the situation is pretty bad and we should be depending or effectively expect the IMF program to resume as soon as possible because once that resumes, we can move towards some kind of macroeconomic stability. Without that, things can go much uh, down southwards. No, I know that the entire world is in a reasonably bad situation. It's not only Pakistan, but in Pakistan in particular, it's what 30, 28 to 30 billion dollars have to be repaid in the next few months. So unless a package is done with somebody, unless Pakistan gets the ability to roll over these loans, then there could actually be a debt crisis or a default sort of a situation coming up. Would you think that's a possibility? Uh, that is not a possibility till at least April 2024. Why? Because a lot of these are multilateral loans uh, due to banks such as the Asian Development Bank or the World Bank or the ISDB. So they mostly get rolled over. Similarly, there are a lot of loans from China. Uh, there is an expectation that they get rolled over. There is no commercial debt per se. The only commercial debt repayment that's coming is in April 2024, and that is the euro bond. So one hopes or expects that a lot of these will be rolled over and uh, the euro bond will be repaid on time in April 2024. But till that time, I do not see the country defaulting. Uh, but yes, there will be trouble. There will be stress in the currency markets, in the commodity markets. But a, de a full default, as we say, is definitely not going to happen. But that would require either whatever the discussions are in Geneva, those going through successfully, whatever discussions are taking uh, place with the Saudi Arabians, that has to go through successfully. And as you said, China has to agree to roll over, right? China has got, what, 30% of Pakistani debt. So all of these three would need to fall into place. That is correct. So even without Geneva, I think it's important to consider here that most of the pledges in Geneva are essentially long-term project debt loans. So it's not, they were never really going to materialize over the next six to 12 months anyway. They will materialize over a period of four years. So we don't really expect much, uh, much to come from Geneva anyway. Yes, Saudi Arabia, that's important. If we get some new deposits from Saudi Arabia, then this will enable us to start importing more and essentially start opening up the economy. Because currently, uh, there are a lot of administrative pressures due to which uh, imports have been stopped and due to which the eco economy has is contracting. So yes, not a complete default here, but definitely with Saudi health, it will be possible to kickstart the economy again. Well, you know, inflation or a crisis like this always hurts the poor more than, than, than others. And I guess that's the situation in Pakistan as well. But there also be, seem to be some regional problems like Baluchistan. We're hearing 600,000 bags of, of wheat are required out there, which have been promised still to arrive. Are there regional differences also? Uh, yes, that's correct, because some regions are wheat surplus because the, the wheat growing regions Balochistan being an arid region is not a wheat surplus region. So this is a distribution problem more than anything else. Even if you look at the price differential, in certain areas, price of wheat hasn't really increased. If you're looking at Punjab, if you're looking at Southern and Northern Punjab, but in Sindh and Balochistan, prices increased because the wheat crop there suffered. So this is a distribution problem and we will see some kind of uh, fresh distribution of wheat moving towards the region and prices subsiding. Again, this is not a wheat shortage problem per se right now. This is more of a distribution problem. Yes, but there is one issue which comes with negotiating, for example, with the IMF or negotiating with other countries, is that quite often there's conditionality that comes with it. And that conditionality is sometimes politically difficult to, to implement. And Pakistan's been seeing political instability as well. So let's say there are XYZ conditions that are laid down to roll over loans. Uh, we've already seen some of that happening, that 1.8 $1.18 billion didn't come through in November. So if there is conditionality and Pakistan can't meet it, that could also lead to a crisis. Uh, that is 100% correct. So the government actually right now is working towards meeting those preconditions, one of them being uh, uh, ensuring that the PKR starts floating against the dollar, another one being rationalization or increase in energy prices and rationalization of subsidies and uh, uh, the third condition being increase in gas prices. So all of this is happening and we would see these steps being played out over the next 30 to 40 days and eventually the IMF coming in. If, as you said earlier, due to political volatility, these decisions are not taken, then we may be looking at something uh, similar to Sri Lanka over the next six to nine months.
All right, so it seems to be a precarious situation out there in, in Pakistan. Let's see what actually happens and let's see whether that, that conditionality is actually met. Thank you so much, Mr. Khan. Thank you so much for joining us with our perspective. So let's see what happens in the UAE, what happens in Saudi Arabia, what happens in, in Geneva. Some of that conditionality is never easy to actually meet. So Pakistan is going to have to do quite a balancing act and that also on a tightrope fairly high above the precipice.